looking, engaging with art, engaging with art critically, creatively, and contextually. Uh, and it's hosted by the Siegel Foundation for the Arts. So um, um, this session is going to look at three questions. So uh, I think you can see them on your screen now. The first is, what is art? Uh, so we'll be looking at what we recognize as art personally. Um, and then how do we engage with it? Um, so how do we un interact with art, right? Do we understand it? Do we like it? If we do, why do we like it? And the third question is, how is it made available to us? So by this, I mean, uh, how is art presented to us, right? So sometimes we hear that certain pieces of art are masterpieces. So why is why those pieces, right? Uh, why those artworks? Um, so uh, when we think of art, we're usually relying on our, you know, the art that we've seen throughout our lives. And that's how we personally define what art is for us. So um, this session is meant to be an uh, introduction to art through the subject art history. Um, and art history is very direct, it's the history of art. So along with these questions, we're going to be looking at Indian art history in specific. Uh, so, um, okay, let's start with the question, what is art? So um, I just want to ask, what is art? What do you guys think? Um, any immediate responses to this? Or, um, you know, it doesn't, it can just be, I mean, we can just try to build up a definition together. It doesn't have to be, this is exactly art, right? Any responses? You can just unmute and speak. The way to express yourself. Yeah. As she said, a way to express yourself without talking, but with pictorial and more engaging things. Yeah, that's a really good definition, thanks. Um, okay, uh, any other responses, you know, based on things you've seen, if there's a particular art artwork you like? Be as creative as possible. Okay, yeah. Anyone else? Maybe something what you imagine and you want to put it down on a paper without, or any material and actually yeah. without yeah. Like, talking or speaking to someone you can just paint it out or do something yeah thank you yeah uh so i personally think that the question what is art you know it's very big right we can't i don't know i personally don't think we can say you know in one sentence this is exactly what art is because there's so many ways to define it uh but i think um Another way of thinking about it is what is not art, right? So um, this is, again, I mean, all of these are technically artworks, but then th the question I'm asking is, what do you not personally define as art, right? So um, for example, I'll tell you about me. I'm used to seeing very realistic works of art. So landscape painting, portrait painting. So if I take the number two in this, uh, in this slide, I'm not used to seeing works of art like this. So this is not what my personal definition of art is. So does anyone want to respond? You can just, you know, say what number you think is art or is not art, and you can just explain. <clears throat> okay, um, Hitisha, I can see you. So you can start and then the other person can go. Even I think that number two is not art because art is more, intricate it has many hmm. things to it the second one seems really plain like there's hardly any hmm. imagination or creativity in it <laughs> okay yeah. uh someone else was going to speak I, yes i think all of them are art but hmm. each one of them is interpreted in a different way okay. like everything has a different meaning behind it so it is portrayed in a very different manner yeah that's a really good response. Thank you. Uh, I think there's one more person. Or yeah, anyone can speak. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, okay, let's move on for now. 
Um, so today I'm going to be showing a lot of works of art. And I just want to ask you all to look at it in these two ways. So you can obviously go beyond this, but this is just something to keep in mind today. Uh, so the first one is objectively. So this is describing any lines, shapes, colors, uh, objects that you see in the picture. And the second one is subjectively. So this is your reaction to the artwork, right? So um, anything that stands out to you, whether you like it again, uh, why do you like it? What do you like about it? And um, like I said, there's so much more than these two, but let's just keep these in mind when you're responding, especially. So um, as with most things in the world, um, there have been many debates and discussions about the topic, what is art, right? So they're very philosophical, but they ask very simple questions, right? Um, and the first one uh, that I want to pick is, is art an imitation of what we see in the world? So uh, let's just focus on the question alone right now. Um, are there any immediate responses? Is art always something that we see, you know, based on something we see in the world? Can I say? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Art is not something you always see. It can also be completely out of imagination. Like maybe we imagine something and then we want to put it down on a material. So it's yeah. not basically all we see. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Um, Gia? Um, yeah, I just want to say that, yes, I even I think so that art is not something that is always what we see, we draw, or we depict. It is. It can be anything which goes in our mind as well. Because if, uh, for example, if we see if a person is going through depression, the state of mind which he is having, he can describe it in his own um, depiction. And that can be also an art. So art can be anything which can be like illustrated. Yeah. Uh, so as you can see, art. I'm also, yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, sorry. Uh, I think that art definitely is not only based on what we see, but without like, we draw the inspiration from what we see. So it's like a really major part also depends on what we see, how we yeah. see the world around. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. I think that's also a lot about what today's session is about. You know, how we, um, in our own, like, environment, how we draw from our environment. And that's how we define uh, art for ourselves, right? So, uh, as you can see, I've also put a picture next to the question. Uh, so, the name and the date of the picture are below that red line. Um, so, you can just take some time, uh, like, a few seconds to look at the picture properly. Um, you know, any elements of the picture, anything that stands out to you. Um, and we can take some responses. I mean, you can literally tell me if you like it, if you don't like it, and yeah, anything, any re reactions to it. The painting has a lot of elements to it and a lot of different things in like animals and wildlife and yeah. the golden aura at the head. Of yeah, the like Google it, it is highlighted, always it's highlighted the golden part. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, so as we can as you can see in the picture, probably you know it's um, art is not always exactly how you know things are in the world. It's not an an imitation, but it draws inspiration from the world. Uh, so to give some background to this picture, it's a picture that appears in this text, the Padshanama, where there's this hunting scene that's described, and next to the description, there's this image. So um, hunting wasn't just a pastime for rulers. Uh, a lot of historians say that it's a way of uh, the emperor showing power over the land, right? So over the physical territory by hunting the animals that are there. Um, and the emperor Shah Jahan, as you can see, and as many of you mentioned, he has a halo around his head, the way we show many gods, right? Um, and he's also slightly larger than the other figures, if you look at it, uh, because he's the ruler. Um, and there's a lot of other details in the painting. I mean, the colors are all just 
very similar, very yellowy colors. Uh, and then the all the figures are camouflaged into the environment. They're all wearing shades of green. And yeah, any anything else anyone wants to talk about before we move on? Um, yeah, also their heads are all in profile. So they never look straight, um, you know, like towards the viewer. They're all facing this way because that's how a lot of nobility in Mughal paintings are shown. There are many layers in the painting, like there's a uh, foreground, midground, and then the background. Yeah. So you can see of a far, you know, there's yeah. a whole. It's a really good observation. Thank you. Um, so uh, let's move on to the second one. Okay. Mm. Just a minute. Yeah. So uh, again, it's the same question. Uh, I hope it's visible, um, like the whole slide. OK. Um, so again, it's the same question, uh, but I put a different picture next to it. Uh, so again, we can take some time to look at the picture. And I can take yeah. any, any responses. Feel free to interrupt me and speak. Yes. Yeah. OK. Um, this was made completely out of imagination, maybe it was inspired from something the artist has mm. seen, but yeah. obviously this can't be in real life. So it was completely out of imagination. Yeah. And it, it has a really deep meaning. I, we can see that about time. So it does not really always have to be what you see. It can also be out of imagination and with the yeah. beginning. Yeah. Uh, any other responses? This tries to depict the future, like if we don't take care of it, it can end up in such a barren or horrible mm. condition. Yeah. Yeah, because there's no vegetation, there's only rocks and water. Mm. And time is melting, like it's over or something. Mm. Yeah, that's a really good interpretation, I think. Um, I mean, People have said so many different things about this painting because of the melting clocks. So, you know, some people have said it's the way when we sleep, you know, how time doesn't seem like if I go to sleep now, sometimes I wake up and it seems I only slept for two, three minutes, but I actually slept for a couple of hours. So, you know, the way time doesn't really make sense when we sleep, when we dream. Uh, some people say it's about that, but I think that's the point. You know, we can make anything out of it. We can interpret it how we want. Um, so I personally really like this painting because it was one of the first uh, artworks that I was introduced to when I started learning art history. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember looking at it and being very confused at first because, you know, you don't normally see these things, like you said, in nature, in the world. Um, and uh, so I just want to give some context to the picture again. Uh, it's a picture called uh, by the artist Salvador Dali. And he was part of this group of painters called the Surrealists uh, in Europe in the 1920s. So um, surreal from the word, it means something that's a mix of dreams and reality. So again, like in this picture, you get very bizarre things like melting clock. And on the left, on the complete left, that orange object, it's a metal clock, I think. And the ants gathering, gathering on it, the way ants gather on food. So um, uh, the landscape in the background is actually a real place. So it's the coast of Catalonia where the artist lived. So like you can see, it's a mix of things that are real and things that are not real. Um, so surrealism also, it was about tapping into the unconscious part of our mind, uh, the, the part of the mind where, which is active when we sleep, right? When we dream. Um, <clears throat> so just taking from this picture, I'm just gonna leave the what is art question for now. And we'll do a small activity based on this. Uh, this is a game that the Surrealists invented. It's called The Exquisite Corpse. And I've modified it a little for the online mode. So um, we're going to be, the point of the um, game is to make a complete body. And we're going to be making groups of four. So in each group, there's going to be one person who will think of the head, one person for the midsection and the arms, one person for the legs, and one person to draw it. Um, so the purpose of the game is to kind of collaborate and come up with something unexpected. And it's also about chance because uh, once all of these different paths from different people come together, you'll get something, whatever you get is a matter of chance, right? Uh, so uh, I just want to say also, if there's any 
missing we're going to be putting you in breakout rooms so if there's any missing members like uh, or additional members more than four or less than four just adjust accordingly either you can um, add a part of the body like a tail or something or you can uh, you know assign two body parts to one person so okay here are the instructions please listen carefully and just take it down maybe because um, and you won't be seeing the slide after the breakout rooms open so everyone is going to be put into breakout rooms in groups of four and uh, like I said, one person for head, one person for midsection and arms, one person for legs, and one person for drawing it. So um, once you're in the group, just decide amongst yourself who wants to do which part, right? So divide it equally. And then uh, we'll give you two minutes to think of an interesting way of drawing that body part. So it can be anything you want. It can be an object. It can be a fantasy creature. Um, and just don't make it too detailed or complicated so that because one person has to draw it, right? Um, after that, uh, just write a short description in the chat so that, that the person who's drawing it can take all of the descriptions and put it together. So we're going to be sending you this link to the Sketchpad website. When you open it, uh, you'll be able to draw there. Once you're done drawing, just copy paste it, uh, copy it and paste it in the breakout rooms. So um, you won't have to share the picture with everyone at the end. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Jia. Yeah. Do you have a question? Yes, yeah. I have a doubt. Uh, so basically, uh, like we will be dividing into each group having four people. So every yeah. person has to like, uh, like one person will be drawing the head and then the one person will draw the arms and the legs and then the fourth person will be combining all this. Is it like this? No, no, no. So each of you just the people with the body parts just think about an interesting way of drawing the body part. Just think about it and uh, write the description in the chat or just talk uh, just say it to the person who's drawing it so the person drawing it will have to just from the description open the sketchpad website and put it all together okay. um so yeah again this uh, you won't have to share it if you don't want to and also it's not about art skills or drawing well or anything we just want to see what kind of combinations you come up with and the experience you have so uh, i just want to show you the sketchpad website before we start so it opens up to this blank page. Uh, this is the pencil tool. It's the most basic one. You can just use that. Or if you want to, uh, I mean, because of time, we just go with something basic. Um, so this is a drawing I did. So once you're done, there's export here. It's at the bottom left. So if you just put your cursor on that toolbar, you'll get export. Press export and you'll go to this page. Um, and at the bottom, you can see share. Uh, once you go to share, it shows you the image uh, format. So, I mean, it's a bit complicated. Just go straight to share the bottom, the red button, and you'll get this box, um, which lets you copy direct link. Just copy the link and paste it. Uh, please let us know if you have any difficulties in the middle. Um, yeah. So in terms of the picture, like you can see, it's literally anything you want. Mine is like a television head with tentacles coming out of it and a flower body and stems for arms and noodle legs. So it's anything you want. Um, so we'll just, I hope everyone's taken this down. Do you have any questions about the instructions? Any confusion? Okay. Uh, I think we can start then putting, I mean, getting into the breakout rooms. So, Angel, we have 17 yeah. participants now. So, I'm doing four okay. for the moment. Because yeah, we seem to have lost a few. Maybe they got disconnected or something. Yeah. Okay. So, so I'm doing four groups for now to keep it as even as possible. Okay. Hello, Saira. Okay, so everyone's here. Or we, Sanvi. You guys want to decide who's going to do the drawing?
So which one of you wants to do the drawing? Hello? None of you? No, I'll do it. You'll do it? Lovely. Okay. So who wants to take the head? I can take the head. Okay. The body part? The midsection? Sanvi, you'll, you'll think of the midsection? No, I'll do the head. Oh, uh, oh you're doing head. Okay. Urvi, would you think of the midsection? Yes, ma'am. All right. And do, you, do either of you also want to think of the legs? Because I'm not technically a participant. <coughs> Saira can think of how she wants to do their legs. Okay. So now you know what to do. What to do. You just on, on the chat, just type instructions for Saira, how you want the head and the, uh, the, the center part of the body to be drawn. Okay, and she can look at it, go to Sketchpad and do the drawing following your instructions. And then she can add the legs the way she wishes to add them. All right, we've got about five minutes. No, no thoughts on chat. Come on, we need to give her time to draw. Okay, good. All right. So I think you have a new participant in this group too. So. Hello, welcome. We, uh, you and I are hoverers. Sorry, one second. There's a lot of stress going on in the office. Uh, Kashvi, do you know what we are doing in with this activity? Uh, no, ma'am. Okay, so uh, guys, I'll take one moment from your group and just tell um, what it is. So actually, do one of y'all want to do it since y'all are already in the would you like to tell Kashvi? Saira, Uvi, Sandi. One of you just tell her what we are doing so that she can get right in. Nobody? Okay. Mika, you're on mute. Were you asking something, Rajmika? I was just asking one of them to tell Kashvi what they're doing in this activity because she just joined. So just to give ah, them. Okay. So like we are drawing a different body parts and collating it together to make a whole body. It's on the chat, actually. They've already put the instructions on the chat and Saira is supposed to be drawing. So maybe Kashvi can do the next, Saira. Okay. Ashwi, you need to tell Saira how to draw the legs. 
Uh, Saira, have you gone to Sketchpad? Been able to get to Sketchpad? No, ma'am, I don't have the link. Oh, okay. All right, I'll just give it to you one second. Rajmita, do you have it? I should have. Or I will find it. Um. Now put it on the chat. Hi, I just wanted to ask, did everyone get the link for Sketchpad? Okay, thanks. Also, just keep the final drawing link um, in a separate place, like um, just copy it somewhere else, because once you put it, once the breakout room is closed, you won't be able to access as in that message again. Did you all get the link to Sketchpad or I just got it? I put it on the chat. Oh, okay. I was in the other group by then. Ah, okay. I put it on the chat.
I hope everyone's back now. Yeah, okay. Uh, so um, before we, yeah, before we go on, let's just hear like experiences. Also, because there's very few of us, maybe we can screen share um, um, some of the drawings that you did. I think at the end also people couldn't share the pictures with their groups. So uh, if I'm, anyone from any of the groups wants to screen share, please let us know. We'll just give you access. Rajanya has the uh, um I can share it. Yeah, wait, I'll just share it. Oh it's zoom. Yeah, I hope you can see it. Yeah, we can see it. Yeah, people explain. It is a light girl with uh, yeah. body as a paint palette with a lot of paint in it. And then wings with pencil feet. I'm ballerina suits. And since we did not have time to make the hair, the paintbrush as the hair looks like a Brahmin Choti, like Hiti Shatpur. And the wings were supposed to be fish scales, but we did not have enough time to elaborately draw it. Yeah, fish scale wings. Okay, thanks guys. Um, the other group. Um, um, so this was our thing. So the face, we made actually a back of the dom's pencil. That was the idea to make a shape like that. And it kind of makes it seems alienish because, you know, the body is a UFO and the legs are of a you know, a, 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 like, you know, a alien from another planet or maybe an animal from another planet. We kind of just made it ourselves. Mm -hmm. And the hands are of sun rays. The rays is coming out. So it's very, you know, it has many things in it. So, yeah. Thank you. This looks so nice. Uh, the other group, there's, I think there's two more left. If someone wants to share. Yes, I can share. share. So, Jashodhara, please explain. Um, so, the head is supposed to be like a supermarket basket, maybe. And then the body is of a butterfly. And then the legs are of, of like an upside down lotus basically has five legs. Uh, the last group, anyone? Okay, uh, you, anyone wants to talk about the experience? Like, what did you think? Uh, did you enjoy doing it? What did you think of the picture that you ended up with? It's a good and hilarious and weird at the same time. It was interesting, but then uh, because we didn't have too much of time, I couldn't finish the drawings. It is a bit weird. Okay. Um, okay, so I think I'll just continue with uh, the PPT. Uh, if anyone has any response, you can still respond. Okay, um, so the next question is, does art have to be beautiful? So um, what does everyone think? Um, does art have to be beautiful? Do you think this painting is beautiful? I think every painting is beautiful, but it has their own meaning behind it. Like this painting, it may be the artist wanted to show the real self and that maybe, you know, 
we don't have to cover up ourselves all the time or we don't have to remove our body hair and we can yeah. be in nature maybe i don't have a nice house i'm living in a nature in, in nature so that can also be the depiction of the painting so i think a painting if you look at it in a certain way it can always be beautiful because there's no definition of beautiful so i think that's what she was yes uh, as she said there's also a quote that beauty lies in the eyes of beholder so it is that thing only we mm. need, if we want to see it as beautiful it is beautiful and if we don't it will not seem beautiful yeah i think that is a really good point you know um about it's our own individual understanding what beauty is and that's how we think about what is beautiful and what is not any yeah. other responses can i see it um so maybe it has a meaning like maybe the person who's going yeah. through a very hard time like uh the butterflies and the birds maybe there was hope which butterflies and the birds may depict hope that there may be a better life uh, going forward the thorns well obviously depict the hard time she's he or she is going through and um i think maybe the hummingbird will be a symbol of good luck because i've read in many books that a hummingbird is a symbol of good luck mm -hmm. and then over there you can see that the cat is ready to pounce so maybe the person is ready to get back to her own life and be happy again and get out of that dark time yeah thank you so much for that interpretation like i mean i think it's a it's a really good thing to like it doesn't have to be you know exactly what the artist in, intended but it's like a really good thing on our own just to think about what many elements of the picture might have been um so just again to give context this is a self portrait uh, by frida kahlo so as you can see there are so many things coming together in this picture that maybe naturally don't come together you know um there's you know all of these animals and so on maybe in real life they don't really come together like this um so the artist was also part of the group called the surrealists and um also part of the group called the magical realists so the word is up here um so magical realism like the word itself it's coming together of magic and real magical things and realistic things right um, and it's similar to surrealism but then they came up the two movements they came up in different places and they have some differences between them so um we can also look at this in terms of symbols like someone was saying sorry i can't see the names um so like we generally know black cats sometimes are symbols of bad luck so um and um uh, in this particular context uh, people talk about the hummingbird as a symbol of love in mexico where the artist is from so uh, this was also in context of the artist's divorce of her, from her husband it was uh, you know soon after that and her husband is also a famous artist um and there's a, the dead hummingbird is kind of the death of that relationship that's what it symbolizes and i mean that's just one interpretation of what it is so we can talk about it in different ways it doesn't have to be that that's exactly what the artist meant because we can't really you know know exactly what the artist wanted to say through this picture um um yeah i mean i was going to say i don't think it's necessarily beautiful because it's a bit kind of you know it has a very dark kind of mood and it's a bit scary because of the thorns and um, yeah but it's a very interesting picture still i really like it okay um so this is a more general question is art contextual so um i think art is contextual uh, for example you know i've been see used to seeing landscape paintings um uh, from when i was young so that's how i define art right and it's according to where i've grown up my cultural context my social context um so if someone for, for example shows me like a block of wood in an exhibition and says this is art i'll be very confused because that's not the type of art i'm used to seeing so um in different contexts art has been def defined in different ways right uh and there are many historical processes that made certain definitions of art more prominent than others so in the section i'm just going to kind of go more into history um 
so yeah for example in very old european art that we usually call fine art drawing painting and sculpture that was realistic was seen as you know the best kind of art so even if it was a depiction of a religious story or a myth the people would be shown you know with their correct anatomy and there'd be very um, accurate showing of light and shadow and so on and another thing that's very important in this kind of realistic art is perspective so um like this is just the normal definition of perspective like when we talk about perspective visually so um there's this example that's always used when explaining perspective so if i'm looking at a train track from above from the sky looking down it's going to be parallel but then if i'm standing on the train track and looking out it's going to be converging right at the horizon mostly um and in a similar way when we look out at a room somebody mentioned this earlier you know the person at the complete back would be smaller the person at the front would be bigger so um there's that differentiation between the background the foreground the mid mid ground um so many older indian paintings don't have this kind of understanding perspective for example um when we see this picture of shah jahan you can see that the emperor like i said earlier is a bit bigger than everyone else even though he is in the middle of all the figures so if there's perspective the person at the complete front would be the biggest uh so because of colonization these standards of european art actually became the standard of what art is it spread um you know across the world so um for a long time before colonization um travelers were recording a lot of things about different places they went to including india in their travel logs and they usually accompanied these by images uh and they were drawings so, of you know um architecture archaeological sites of people um and things that were termed as curiosities so uh what does what do you think a curiosity is like if i call an object a curiosity not an example just yeah what it what do you think it means maybe that object is something that can have many interpretations and people will think about it a lot for example okay. like if there's something very unexpected in a painting and we don't know the meaning behind it but you know the artist had something some he intended to put it there so maybe you know we can think about it maybe that's there for us to kind of leave us on a cliffhanger like that okay yeah so yeah i just want to take what you said like um it's something that we don't quite understand so in this context it's something that's unfamiliar or strange so you know um if you think about somebody coming from europe at that time and they've never seen certain objects you know and they're very unfamiliar with it it looks very strange to them so that was what they call curiosities um so many europeans because of all these um drawings and so on they formed this image uh, like a mental picture of india before they'd ever been there so uh, for example there's this art historian who talks about how when europeans came to india and they saw the gods in temples and paintings and so on they called them monsters so uh, the context for this is um, in europe in uh, the 16th and 17th century there was this debate uh, on what is modern so there was this transition from uh there was a move away from religion that is in uh, europe it was the church and christianity and so on and there was this movement to modernity as opposed to religion so uh the modern what they were talking about is something that is scientific and rational so you know each individual had to think for themselves they had to make decisions for themselves they had to test their theories and they shouldn't take what religion says as the ultimate truth so uh many countries in asia and africa when uh, the british or the europeans came you know they saw all these religious artifacts in religious places and they thought that these places were very backwards and very you know the opposite of modern so in this kind of thinking uh asian and african art and so on it was considered to be less developed than european art so later when the east india company transferred power to the british crown after 1857 many european schools of art were set up in india and these styles of art were taught to indians uh so this is another kind of uh, history so in european traditions of art uh, the invention of the camera in the 1830s was a kind of disruption in how art was thought of so like i said earlier there was a lot of realistic art right so if there's a portrait painter who does realistic art and then the camera comes along and it captures something much more accurately then there's no need for that kind of realistic art anymore because the camera does that job 
but then as you might all know a lot of these traditions of art is still very popular and they're still very valuable like we know um, you know some of the best most pricey works of art in the world are still you know before the 19th century they're in this realistic style uh, the Mona Lisa for example it's done in that realistic style and it's still very popular um, so uh, around that time, also in India, in 1840s, the, cam the photography started to be used. And uh, in most cases, it was European photographers uh, or people who uh, traveled with the companies, like the East India Company, who were bringing um, cameras, right? And many princely families also, they started to be photographed. Uh, and they were previously painted in their coats. Um, so, you know, the camera itself was seen to be a very modern object and they wanted to present themselves as being very modern rulers. So they would start getting photographed in their quotes. Uh, as you can see in this picture, uh, by that time also a lot of Indian artists had adapted this realistic style, right? Like Raja Ravi Verma's work is one of the best examples of this. Um, and many British officials, they started using drawing and visual arts to document parts of India. And they started creating this image, you know, very defined image of what India is like. Um, and this was also specifically in the context of the mutiny in 1857, where the British were kind of taken by surprise, a surprise by, that the Indians were rebelling against them. So they wanted to understand them better. They wanted to rule them better. And uh, that was the ultimate objective of, you know, uh, photographing and making all these drawings, even surveying uh, archaeological sites and so on. So uh, what I wanted to bring out with this section um, was that, you know, art and photography, they're not just very passive mediums or something that we use for leisure. It's not just that. But in the colonial period, it was a very, very powerful tool for the British to understand the people, to rule them better, and to create a certain image of um, places that were colonized. So we can just take some time to look at this. If anyone has any responses to the section, uh, have you seen any princely paintings or photographs? They're quite famous, I think. And any other works by Ravi, Raja Ravi Verma, they're also very popular. Any responses? I went, went first. I just looked at this picture. The king, like it looked really clumsy, but my attention was caught at the pot, that uh, plant over there. And it's a really nice balance between a really simple and well-known thing with a really filled up part. Like, the king with all the jewelry and everything. Mm. The yeah, color there's... combination really caught my eye. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. the color combination really goes really nicely with all the background and everything. Yeah. And um, I, I like what Nisha said, even my attention was caught to the pot behind it. I don't know why, but the, that was the first thing I looked at. Yeah. And yeah, that's it. Yeah, I think this also, this format, if you look at a lot of princely paintings and photographs, you see that, you know, it's a very kind of pose. They're either standing up and their arm is on something or they're sitting down. And then usually there's this curtain behind and it's kind of showing the city or the place the person is ruling. And then there are these random objects around. Sometimes it's books, sometimes it's plants uh, or yeah, some, I mean, yeah. and. I mean, you can kind of see very different patterns when you look at them. Sometimes they're in traditional clothes. Um, other times it's like mil military uniforms or suits sometimes. Yeah. Uh, if any of you gets a chance, you should really look at these pictures. They tell you a lot about how, I mean, even, yeah, a lot about the history of the time as well. Um, so uh, no other responses. I would like to say something. Yeah, so I wanted to say that the main focus of the picture is like uh, the artist tried to make the main focus of the picture the king. So he used really bright and, uh, you know, 
uh, bright colors so that it would catch the attention of the people. Whereas for the background, the artist used um, very plain colors. Yeah, I think, yeah, it's like a little more muted, the building behind. But then again, it's still in the same kind of color scheme. So it all blends together really well, I think. Um, so, yeah, I just want to leave texture, you all with uh, the texture of the plant. Uh, the pot is really uh, detailed, yeah. but the clothes, the folds could have been a little more detailed. Okay. Does any of you do art yourselves? Like, are you okay? That's really nice. Uh, so, yeah, I just want to leave you with two interesting questions. And these are quite different to what we've been talking about till now. So, uh, like I said, individually, we make our own definitions of art. But then these definitions, are, I mean, our definitions of art are also linked to authorities on art, right? So we can't really separate those two. So there are art historians, there are scholars who know about the history of art. There's auction houses that sell paintings. Um, so they put a certain monetary and academic value on the art. And that's how, you know, the real world works. So we can't really separate our definition of art from these authorities. So the first question is, can forgery be considered as art? So a forgery, as you all might know, is uh, an imitation of an original artwork or a document. And um, just to get people thinking, I just want to share the story behind this uh, painting. And it's, it's very interesting. So in the 17th century, there was this fa famous uh, Dutch artist called Johannes Vermeer. His name is up here. Um, he painted this work of art, The Girl with the Pearl Earring. It's quite famous. Uh, and then from, yeah. Okay, I thought someone was going to say something. So um, in the 1900s to the 1940s, suddenly there was this, a lot of new paintings by Vermeer coming up, right? So people said these were attributed to him. And then there were many experts who had studied his work for a very long time. And they also agreed that these were original works. And there was one expert in particular, he looked at this painting and he said, it was one of the best examples of Vermeer's work. Um, so these actually turned out to be the work of this forger, Han van Meegren. Uh, and he used pigments that would be originally used by the artist. And he used this um, material called synthet synthet synthetic resin, sorry, that would harden the paint. So. Um, for ex okay, just to explain this point, um, a lot of in older artwork, they use very different paint pigments, right? So for example, lead white or very expensive pigments that we don't use anymore. So lead, for example, is poisonous. So we don't use that in paint anymore. But uh, when you chemically analyze the paint, you find these substances and then you can tell that this is from that period. And um, a lot of older artwork, because of time, it starts cracking on the surface. So what this artist did, I mean, this forger did, he um, used this material resin and he baked the painting. So the surface started to crack and it looked very old. So um, one of his artworks actually got into the hands of Hermann Goering, who was a Nazi official. He was one of Hitler's right-hand men. And when the, the war ended, the allies got, a, um, got their hands on all these pictures and they traced these pictures back to Van Meegren. So, um, the crime, I mean, he was arrested for this crime for collaborating with the Nazis, for supplying them with art. And the punishment for that crime was collab uh, was the death pen penalty. So he had to confess to this crime of forgery because otherwise he would die. So, um, you know, today, a lot of this forger's work is actually in the same gallery as Johannes Vermeer, as the original artist. So, um, yeah, just based on that. Uh, this uh, story, and but his works are also very valuable these days. Yeah, that's true. So, any other thoughts? Any thoughts? Um, you know, can forgery be art? I guess forgery can be art because at the end of the day, you are you know looking at a document or a file or something like that, and you are you know thinking of it as your own and now you're interpreting it and making something from your creativity but it is being like i guess it is being taken from the document so yes it can be art because as we discussed in this session like art is something you can interpret and you can do it you know with your imagination so maybe 
it can be yeah um, i it's think a... it is producing the same uh, almost the same piece of work uh, which uh, one another person did some time ago so uh, that can be very challenging to recreate and you need to really apply your thinking skills and your uh, memory to like uh, apply your knowledge and make another piece which is exactly like the one so you can actually forge it yeah so it's yeah i think very different uh, people would recognize it's very different hmm. and it won't have any value. yeah so yeah, I think it does take some sort of creativity. Again, it takes skill. You need that sort of artistic skill. But then there's also the intent, right? The intent is to um, copy a work of art because you know this work of art or this artist's name is very valuable. So you're copying it. So there is some kind of criminal, criminal intent in that. So I think that's what distinguishes forgery and you know the original work. It's not only creativity. It's not something that you came up with yourself. Any other responses? Now, if you copy something from another artist or another, you know, person who is doing art, we have to give them credit or else, you know, that can become a very big crime in the art thing for anything, actually. Even if we are writing something, we have to give credit. So I guess if we give the full credits and if we like you know put it out that this is not my own work and i've mm. just taken an idea from someone else then i don't think it can be a crime because then you are not giving yeah. yourself yeah i think that is a very important point in any kind of study like you said it's very important to give credit to people who came before you because they're the ones who you know have got you to this point because you've gone through all their work and that's how you get to this point so yeah i think that's a good differentiation to make giving credit and not giving credit. So saying that something is your own or um, when it's actually not, yeah, that's a good differentiation. Somebody else was speaking before Sanaya. Um, um, if you want to go. Any other responses? Okay. Um, so the last question is, what is something that is labeled and perhaps sold as art that you cannot relate to? So, uh, you know, many times we come into contact with great art in museums or exhibitions, and we're very confused, right? So like, for example, abstract or performance art, we don't know how to make sense of it. We're not sure how, what we're supposed to get from it. Um, so yeah, is, is there anyone who can think of something like this? You know, when you came across a work of art and you just were, wasn't sure how to relate, if you, as in you can't relate to it or you can't understand it. Any, like, you can share an experience, you can talk about a particular work of art if you want. Okay, no one? Okay, I mean, I can talk about my... Oh, okay. So, um, basically, I just wanted to talk about this. So, when we go to uh, see a work of art, we, when we go to a museum or an exhibition, sometimes we come across very abstract or, you know, artwork that we just can't understand or something that you just can't relate to. So, uh, my question is, have you had an experience like this? Have you seen an artwork that makes you think like this? never really went to an art museum or something, but online, okay. I, like, the, uh, what do you call Those images or artworks that, like, have multiple meanings, but it looks really simple, but still is really mm -hmm. confusing. Yeah. an exhibition so there i had one of my paintings and it was basically somewhere where people had to buy it 
so you know like if they want they can buy the paintings yeah. so uh, like in my painting there was a woman she had many different colors on her face like it was a portrait side portrait but you know it was full of colors it was not like a normal portrait and there were many more abstract paintings but what i saw there is that people were buying paintings that were like you know i remember there was a painting of mother teresa and that sold very quickly and like you know so the people are buying things that are quite of direct and people like can understand it like easier so okay. that's what i saw that that the abstract paintings weren't getting sold that easily there okay so maybe that's maybe people couldn't relate to it that's why they didn't get it yeah that's really interesting because i've seen the opposite actually even online uh, i don't know if you guys saw this but a while back there was this kind of viral news there was this banana taped to a wall and it was like a piece of art and was i think it was very expensive as well or sometimes even it's just like a blank canvas with like a dot in the middle something like that and it just becomes it it's so expensive like you just can't understand why um so yeah I, another experience there i had this, uh, yeah uh, there is this famous artist i don't know her name where she supplies artwork to a lot of rich families and all mm -hmm. and she literally only uses two materials which is a cleaning mop and black paint she dips the mop mm -hmm. and uh, just applies it to the canvas and yes it is abstract and it's sold for like huge prices mm -hmm. yeah um so i mean i don't really have any response to the question myself as in i don't i don't know how to react myself right to a lot of works of art i just wanted to bring this because it's something that we don't really talk about when we talk about art like this feeling of not understanding or how to make sense of that uh so for example i remember seeing this performance art exhibition so it was held in my university and there was this large group of people and many people like standing together they were all walking in straight lines kind of back and forth in many different directions so um there's this poem play playing in the background and i remember looking at it and just being very confused at first because i i didn't know you know what what should i how should i understand this and there's a lot of professors sitting with me and they all seemed to be enjoying it and i was just you know like how do i react to this uh but then i kind of started making sense of it as it went along because the poem was there as well in the background so it was about how we come across you know people in our lives sometimes we can stick with them sometimes we leave um and then you know we don't come across them again just about life people and circumstances and i actually started getting very emotional when i was watching it um uh, because i related it to the things that ha had happened to me so i think that's also another fascinating part about art um you know sometimes very unexpected things you know touch you or you feel something or you know sometimes you don't expect yourself to feel something or react in a certain way and you do or also you might just not understand it you might just not like it and that's all part of the process of engaging with art uh so i wanted to play this video um i mean it's also just to make you all think but also talking about how i went from not understanding performance art at all to making this performance art film so to give some context it was about i made it as a collaboration with somebody else in a different university and it was about how the how we make conversation online right so as you can see i hope it's like a zoom call format and it's all about how things don't sync up there's a lot of glitches we don't really understand what people are saying we keep repeating things and also about the kind of lockdown life um, you know we are stuck in a very small space there's um, repetition every day we wake up we go to sleep we can't really go outside or meet anyone and yeah it's i yeah uh, just want to play this sorry wait can you hear the audio yes oh okay 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 Oh no, I can't. No, you can't. No. Okay, I'll just reshare then. Um, you have to check on a share presentation audio also. Yeah. Okay. But then either. Sorry. Ah, uh, yeah. Now. 
Okay. I just have to judge it a lot. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, I didn't really know my mother then either. Huh. Please not hear me. Keep talking about the dance. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, could you keep talking Somebody's about? Somebody's arm will kind of extend into like someone's leg, and then like that movement like flows into somebody else and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, we were discussing like the 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 the. Yeah, my parents are immigrants from Nigeria, and they settled in outside of Los Angeles. They I'm like, we do audio the visuals, I can do the visuals. Um, um, but great. This is what I was trying to say, and you just put it in into like such interesting words, like using the space. What if um, I'm going to discard the visuals visuals for a second? But the reason why I said sound is because what if we. Uh, I'm like, we do audio, the visuals, I can do the visuals. Yeah, so, um, I mean, um, again, this is like any other work about we've looked at today, you can understand it you cannot like it if you want um and yeah i just wanted to show this i mean i think it's kind of it's based on a very relatable thing from last year from the pen the start of the pandemic um just being restricted not being able to communicate properly with people uh and so on so um yeah i'm just going to wrap up if anyone wants to respond we can do that I don't know. Oh, I... Okay, so uh, just to wrap up, I just want to summarize what we did today. So we looked at these questions. Um, what type of art do we usually like? And um, how is this shaped by the type of art that we've seen in our social and cultural context? And also what type of art have we later come into contact with that disrupt disrupted our definition of art? So, um, like I said in the previous slide, uh, for me, performance art was very foreign to me, but then I kind of got used to it and then I made a performance art film myself. Um, so, um, again, this last part is just um, what I wanted to bring out this session. So, we usually, we're taught, you know, there's a correct way of doing art or a correct way of looking at art, like drawing accurately. So, you know, sometimes people are like, I can't draw at all. I'm not an artist. But uh, today in the session, I just wanted to bring out that we have, there's so many ways that we can engage with art, right? We can look at the historical context. We can look at the visual elements. Even our emotional reaction to it is part of that. So, I don't think there's any single correct way of looking at or doing art. So that's the end of the session. Um, here are the references I used. These are some books, if anyone's interested. Uh, the second last one is a course from Coursera by the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, this is some material that's related to this module. Um, we'll be sharing it with you in the email, I think. So it's just things that helped me expand my definition of art. So yeah, I think that's it. Um, I just want to end by thanking the Siegel Foundation for the Arts for hosting this workshop. Thank you all so much for attending. I really learned a lot because there was so much interaction. Thank you for that. Yeah. Does anybody want to uh, share anything further? We will send you these resources and please do take a look at them because they're really, really interesting. And uh, they, they'll go, they go a long way in expanding and demonstrating actually all that Angel has spoken about today. Uh, but if there's anything else that any of you want to share, we would love to hear from you.
by the way this uh, this mock painting that somebody mentioned have you seen the artworks they're quite interesting you know so take a look the artist's name is ivan roberts the thing that we actually wanted to put up is something like this and filling it up with color. Nothing. But we got to draw it. I have seen an artist. Uh, she couldn't, you know, quite see. Or, so she used to hear things. She used to hear music. And then she used to interpret interpreted the songs into her artwork. So basically she, you know, whatever sound, each sound had a color for her. So she thought of it and then she painted something. And though she couldn't see it, but she, you know, made it quite like she could feel it. So then like that, you know, she used to sell those paintings. And they were very realistic and very beautiful. Do you know the name of this artist? Uh, no, ma'am, I don't really know the name. I had seen her video on YouTube about her through an app called Insider. So Tiny. there I, yeah. So there I saw her paintings. I don't know if you're talking about the same uh, person, but uh, there's this other Chinese uh, artist um, who um, um, had a hearing uh, disability and uh, is doing performance art through music. She can't hear anything, but she's, and the whole, whole idea is for her, it was like she grew up uh, believing that sound was something that she could never own because she couldn't hear. And this was uh, her way of owning sound, you know, by producing sound. I think that's one of the links um, that we've put up, Christine. Oh, you have. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, also the interesting thing is she can't hear it, but then she can feel the vibrations of sound sometimes. Yeah. So then she works based on that. And that's really interesting also. Oh, I think like sound is a feeling for her. Yeah. yeah. Not, a, not a sound. Yeah. Oh, there's so yeah, please. Yeah. No, I was just, uh, I just got a glimpse of the resources Angel shared and I saw there's a conversation between John Cage and someone. And so John Cage is like, I know we've been talking a lot about visual art and then Angel moved to performance art, but like, so John Cage is this composer and he has, I mean, I think one of the craziest uh, things he's ever composed, craziest in my understanding of course, is something that's called uh, As Slow As Possible. Uh, it's a composition called As Slow As Possible that is uh, supposed to play over a period of 654 years. It's uh, it's a piece that's played in this little cathedral somewhere in Germany. Uh, forgotten is something with H. And uh, like I remember one year or two years ago, there was like a newspaper article because it said, oh, the chord changed this year. And like, because it's, yeah, like the music is limited, but it's supposed to be played as slowly as possible. So people have taken up that challenge and that's like a thing that happens. Uh, yeah, that and I'm sharing a link. Come across this article a long time ago. I'm sure you'll find better articles on this subject of this uh, young teenager whose art and use of colors apparently inspired Picasso and Matisse and big names, you know. Yeah, I've sent it in the chat. Yeah, the, the link of John Cage, that's also really interesting. It's about, so these two people, one is a composer, one is um, a choreogra choreographer. So they don't actually, so usually when we choreograph a, or we choreograph a dance based on song, we look at it together and then, you know, what works with the music and so on. But then they did this thing where they composed it separately. So they just made whatever they wanted and they never actually, you know, put them together for rehearsal or anything like that. So when the performance was happening on that spot, they just play, have both of them together. So it's like, it's a matter of chance, right? Some things might sync up, some things might not. And they did these kinds of exper experiments even with the process of creating, I think. So instead of composing, you know, some sort of musical way, they just, I think, 
I think they had some sort of machine that would just generate what would be the next code, something like that. So it's not like everything is kind of a matter of chance, you know, what the final product is, what each part of um, the performance is and so on. Yeah. It's really interesting. The first part of it sounded like that exquisite corpse game you made us play yeah. in music. <laughs> you know, putting the choreography That's actually, yeah. Together. Yeah. Like the in-person one, I think is a fun, would be really fun to play with people. So like you take a piece of paper, like a scroll, like a long piece of paper and you fold it up and then one person draws like the head and then you unfold and the other person draws like the other part. So once you unravel the whole thing, then you see the body <laughs> together. I think it's like a fun party game. Mm. Yeah. Colin Gray, I listen to his music. And um, he actually has colors for every city or maybe like everything he sees. So that's how he makes his music. Uh, I think this is uh, something that some people have. I'm not sure what it's called, but uh, you know, everything has a color set to him. So his songs basically, you know, when his music videos and all that, they have colors with that song. I don't know if I'm making any sense, but when they, when, like when he puts a song together, in, in, in its music video, the colors are present there, what he felt while writing it, and like that. It's a specific condition. I think it's called synthesis. So some people yeah. have that. It's like the sound and the visuals are linked. Yeah, so now. Okay, so this was really an interesting and fun session. And I hope all of you enjoyed it as much as we did. Thank you very much for being here. And we look forward to seeing you actually at session two and many more of your friends. Yeah, the next session is going to be a little more specific than this. So yeah, please join if you can. And thank you so much again. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you, baby. Bye. Um, bye, mom. Bye, mom. <coughs> okay, Angel. This was wonderful, yeah. but I really am very, very sorry about uh, the turnout, you know, it's been quite, I mean, never kind of uh, get this somehow right. <laughs> no, no, I think it's fine. It was nice. Like we could share the pictures. So that was a good part of it. Yeah, but I don't know how to plug this because I mean, we had 80, 82 or 84 watch registrations and not even 50%. It's ridiculous, and we really need to find a way to kind of. And I, I'm regretting not having opened it to public, you know, because I was scared that if we get too many people, it won't be able to, uh, you know, it won't be manageable and things like that. I wish we had opened it to public because I think yesterday is, uh, today was, I mean, what is your feeling? How do you feel about both the sessions? I really enjoyed it. I didn't actually realize that it was just teachers yesterday. Uh, but yeah, it was meant to be some students. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and I think today was also really nice. There was a lot of responses, so that was good. Uh, but I think also we just can't predict what's going to happen with the participation. I mean, maybe it's classes or just kind of fatigue from like online classes and everything like that. So yes, but I wish people would register then. You know. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, uh, but anyway. So we'll try and do something, whatever possible, to try and ensure a more realistic number for the session too. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, we were quite certain that because it's a teachers and students lot, people will register and turn up unlike, like, mm. opening it up entirely and, you know, but it seems that also and for them in the company. I think maybe we should start charging for the workshops when people... I seriously think that money is the only thing that makes people take, take things seriously. Not all people, but some people. How sad that, that is, no? It is, I but it's for... No, it happens, for sure. Like, if I had a paid teacher to learn Bangla, I'd be... I'd know Bangla by now. 
because it's like, <laughs> yeah, you invest in it. So, yeah, yeah it, it becomes a little casual when it's at a TK now. I'm, oh, I did, I really wanted to join this, but damn, I have to do this also. And then it's, you know, <laughs> so, okay. Okay, let's see you. See you next week. Do next we have Wednesday? a note? Do we have ne next is Wednesday? Yeah. Do we uh, have like a, a, a separate note for the emails that need to go out for the next Wednesday and Saturday one? No, I don't think so. No? Uh, yeah. All right. Okay, see you. All right, see you. Bye. Uh, Ranita, um, are we doing the emails today or for oh, session two because it's Wednesday or you said Monday you want to do it? We can do it early also, whatever. I was thinking also that we have to meet, like last time I made an introduction out of her paper itself. So we will have to like give some information about what we're doing, right? So should I make a note anyway and run it by engineering? Yeah, engineering just maybe three or four lines, you know, so yeah. that it distinguishes session one from session two. And, uh, and maybe I think uh, 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 I'll do the Zoom uh, links just now and send it to you guys. Maybe the student one can go today yeah. and send it to Sunita also and to Deepta also. You know, so that in case somebody tells them that we don't have it, they have it to <laughs> send it to them. And uh, the other one we can do on Monday now, and then we can decide whether we want to open that one out or not. You think if we send it today, it's too early, they'll forget about the links? Is it easier if it's closer to the date? Possibly. For the students, it's not too early, no? Because it's Wednesday. <laughs> yeah. And, and we're, take, we're, we're not taking new registrations, are we? Not for this slot. I mean... I think we should. Yeah. The I think we should because so many haven't uh, shown up, you know. Yeah. So then again, we will have the same uh, very small group. Yeah. So, what's the plan? New registration form for both the days? Separate registration forms for both the days? Yeah, but then how will we segregate who we are going to send the registration form to then? Uh, that's a problem. No? I would suggest the Wednesday one, let's send it to this lot only. Take care the school lot. And uh, uh, the Saturday one, we will don't send it today. We will send it uh, on Monday to the entire database. Hmm? So this one doesn't need a registration form, I guess. Or maybe so it does. Only, do we only stick to the images of discovery students or do we just expand it to the other students also or anybody else on the school? Send it stuff? to all the students, I guess. <coughs> I don't know what to do. Maybe because why not stick to what we did just Yeah, All right, so here's what I, I suggest. Let's uh, today send it to the St. Kabir's and uh, MHS students. Don't include anybody else, okay? Monday, just send it to the others and say those who are interested should register by Wednesday, okay? And seeing the numbers, we open it up for the public uh, se session B of Saturday. I think irrespective, we should open it up to the public because even the numbers are not a clear indicator. Okay. Because I thought about that confirmation email, but that also doesn't work out. We've tried it before, you know, when we ask them to confirm whether they're coming. Sometimes Nothing works. Out. We'll ultimately have to start that. <laughs> <laughs> we can't do it now, halfway. But Sundars will definitely do that. Yeah. Even if it's like, you know, a measly 200 bucks. Yeah. No. <laughs> yesterday, is my God, it was so... It was bad. 
these kids were so quick could be uptight i don't know maybe people just go <laughs> Again, you've got a bad cold and cough. No, you started medication. I started bad too. Be my parents are telling me this is part of homeopathy treatment. It is. It gets really bad at first. Yeah, but you know, has your doctor told you that if your symptoms? Did he ask you for symptoms? He did. I told him all this, and he didn't give me any further information. I was fully expecting diet changes and all that. Did he? What's the duration that he's given you medicines for? So he's given me like. two bottles of each and told me to contact him after that and depending on where no what is the time and after that means how what is the duration one week two weeks one month the patty has a told me when i'm done with these bottles and i'm almost done with them to contact him i don't know if they are for a, maybe they last two months i don't know i'm not sure i have to go meet him again got your medicines no because he just said like you finish these and then you call me and then he will tell me to like you know this, to proceed this will take forever this is what homeopaths do that's why homeopathy has got this uh reputation of it <laughs> taking too long what my doctor would do is he would give you the medicine for like a week or 10 days and say come back after 10 days let's say mm-hmm. but he would give very specific instructions that in the meanwhile if your symptoms have changed call me i will need to change the medicine because it's all based on symptoms and most doctors what they do is when you go back then they ask you the symptoms again then accordingly they give you so you are taking the same medicine okay. while your symptoms have changed <laughs> so obviously the effectiveness is not the same i don't know why they do this i wish i could Call him in heaven. Homeopathic doctor there in Kolkata, and I'll be sorted. Like a good. No, one. I wish I could just call. I'll uh, have Doctor Chatterjee on WhatsApp from Somebody Heaven is Above. You know. There was a yeah. There there was a Black Mirror episode a long time ago about uh, being able to contact. Uh, I shall never mind. I don't know why my head went there. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you find out that it's true and it's actually possible, let me know. I'll try locating him. It was actually a very heartbreaking episode. It's about uh, this woman whose husband dies, young husband, and there is this technology that allows her to so basically you record data. It's all surveillance. It's data that you upload. Okay, of this one person. So all the records that are there of the existence of this person are basically put into like this AI. And then you find if that chip is inserted into this thing that you get and you inflate, and it's it's a person, it's a living person, and then yeah, it's really sad because ultimately she realizes she's unable to grieve, and she's you know because she keeps trying to continue what she's lost through this and all that. Anyway, can I tell you guys a fun story? Can I switch off my? Video for a moment. My father needs to get into my room, so I need to get in the room. Oh. It's not that fun. <laughs> Save it for another time. Yeah. How are you? How are things at the cafe? Sorry. Okay. The scones are a disaster. What? That's why I haven't oh. been to the cafe. Yeah, she hasn't done a good job. <laughs> And today the chef is so so. He'll send a recipe, which the chef is trying today, and if that works out, then we go with it. Otherwise, we just wait for Sohail to come now. I'm sorry, then Arad Smita. In fact, if I feel energetic, I might try Sohail's recipe. But I'm not feeling very energetic because I threw out those Diwali cleaners last night. <laughs> so what that, went wrong? Like what was the part that didn't work out? They were marrying Paki, yeah. They were saying if I don't, if I wasn't supervising it, or with the scones, or with the Diwali cleaners that I threw out. Scones, scones. That like cookies. Oh, that's what happens in most places when they go wrong, actually. Oh. And then she tried another batch, which <laughs> were a little risen, more risen, but you could smell the soda. I mean, taste the aftertaste of the baking soda. 
So that's also out. So now I don't want to tell her to keep trying. So I told Pravat to try today with her. Let's see. I know when I get there, there's a long haul. I'm tired. I really want to get Karan back there. Yeah. Look at this closing business. <coughs> it's back to office on Monday. Your face. Oh God. So Rajasmita, one second. So will you be able to help me out with the session on the 15th? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Did you hear me? No. I asked if you'll be able to help me out with the session on the 15th. See, if you need me to, I can come. I'm going I always to... say yes because I'm nervous until the thing begins. So, okay. just for that day, so what I'll do is I'll copy paste what we had originally planned and send it on the WhatsApp group and ask these guys if there's anything to reconsider or whatever because we because we are going to be doing that Abhi, Abhi said he'll handle the discussion of the thing, the poster thingy he made that we sent. And that'll be the first 10-15 minutes. So just want to know how the rest is going. The, you know, the kitchen object thing and the kitchen museum tour at the end, what is working out, what is not. Just so There's no breakout rooms. <laughs> yeah, so I have to, uh, I'll have to look through everything again because I thought I'm not going to be there. So I haven't seen it and I have no memory of anything. So yeah. I'm going to do that now that you told me. I'm going to do that over today and whatever. Yeah, you don't have to do it right now. I'll just send them the text on the WhatsApp group and let's see if they want to meet or tell us how to go about anything. So, like, yeah. Okay. Um, that's it, I think. Neha, why are you grinning? What? I will stop the recording then. Tell you. You're still recording. Yeah. <laughs>